Okay, this one is, If there is now no condemnation for those in Christ, which is the truth, why does Hebrews 12.29 remind us that God is a consuming fire? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Renee? Yeah, I got to pull it up, but I'm pretty sure I know what it, what it says. Hebrews 12. All right. Well, one of the warnings in Hebrews, first of all, you got to look at what. Let me pull up the verse here. All right. Uh, one of the warnings here in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is to convince the, the Hebrew people that the animal sacrifices that they have to do year by year continually never took away sin. That all the law and all the sacrifices and feasts and everything were just a shadow of Christ. And that now that stuff is gone. And so there's a warning that is often taken out of context in Hebrews 10, 26. It's used so much that if you sin willfully, uh, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. The willful sin there is rejecting the once for all sacrifice of Jesus trying to be justified by animal sacrifices. There remains no sacrifice for sin because Christ died once for all. There is no more sacrifice. Uh, and if you sin willfully by rejecting Christ, uh, you can look forward to judgment. So that's the context of Hebrews is to get people to stop trusting in the temple system. Uh, again, the book's called Hebrews. And there's a reason for that is because they were still uh, trusting in Levitical temple system. Uh, so, but, it, and, and if it, it closes out here in Hebrews 12, it tells, you know, you guys are so focused on the law and this earthly Jerusalem and the temple system. But he says, but ye are come to my, Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable comp company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. All right, so Hebrew people, do not shut your ears to this new covenant gospel announcement. All right, because after everything he showed you, the, the resurrection of Jesus, all the prophecies he fulfilled, and you still shut your ears to him, God's a consuming fire. There's judgment if you reject the Lord. Uh, it says, see, you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word yet once again signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. For God is a consuming fire. So there's uh, two warnings here. One is clearly not to reject Jesus or his grace and stay in the temple system, Hebrew people. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is so. Now, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, don't, don't shut your ears to him. Serve him. There are temporal consequences. God is a consuming fire. But I believe the warning here in the Hebrews 12 is to not reject the grace and the new covenant. They're still stuck in the earthly Mount Zion, the earthly Jerusalem, the earthly temple system. He's telling them to come out of it don't shut their ears to God. And it's just, it's just Old Testament uh, uh, symbology and Old Testament wording so the Hebrew people can understand. So I, I think the Hebrews got it. 
Um, and it, it's still true. Without Jesus, there is judgment. If you reject him, of course there's judgment. Uh, but if you want to take this as just a temporal situation, because the last words here are, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. He promised Israel that, the Hebrew people. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So when he talks about removing the things that are shaken and stuff, I think he's talking about the removal of the old covenant and the remainder of the new. Uh, I could be mistaken. It could be uh, in reference to temporal uh, consequences, but I, I think that's what it's that's what it's talking about. All right. Thank you, sister. Very good. All right, brother Ben. Well, I believe if you, to un, I, I, so, uh, well, if to properly understand Hebrews, I believe you, there, there, there's so many uh, allusions, very clear parallels to the Old Testament, it, particularly Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, Exodus. And so there's so many parallels. I, I think that it's a, very important to be familiar with that to properly understand Hebrews, and I, I'm totally a thousand percent convinced that it's basically about a tale of two sons. Both are both are sons of the father, but one uh, pleased God with his life, and one didn't. One was short sighted, and one was long had the long term view, and that basically is uh, you know uh, uh, Isaac had uh, Jacob and Esau. You know Esau was short sighted. Jacob was long term. He walked by faith. And so I believe Hebrews, again, is a, 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 an epistle to believers and to not become dull of hearing. And there's so many parallels I could, I could mention that, for example. Like, for example, in the Old Testament, um, you know, Moses was unable to enter the promised land because he didn't, uh, he, he became dull of hearing because he struck the rock twice. Because he said, first, strike the rock, which is an allusion to uh, crucifying Christ. But then speak to the rock, and and again he didn't need to he didn't need to strike the rock again. He now had a relationship with the rock, so to speak, so he can now speak to God. And yet he didn't do that. He struck the rock again, and that's exactly what these Hebrews would be doing. They would be if they went back to the law, they would be striking the rock twice, so to speak. And same with uh, when uh, the Israelites failed to enter the promised land because of the evil report. Only uh, Caleb and uh, Joshua uh, were willing to do so. And so that at that point in time, God had delivered them miracle after miracle after miracle, but they were grumbling and rebelling against the Lord. And that was like God's final test. Like, hey, if you don't enter the land now, you're going to be, you're not going to enter the land and you're going to die in the wilderness wandering. It has nothing to do with sal uh, eternal salvation. In fact, he says that all of Israel believed in the Lord and worshipped him after Exodus, but they became because they didn't continue to walk by faith and worship God, and uh, uh, you know they, they 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 lost their trust in the Lord, they could not enter into it. And I think that's exactly what uh, Hebrews is about. Is that, but the rest here is is not the um, is not eternal salvation. It, the rest is uh, having a daily walk by faith and, and resting in, in God and His promises and. So it has a, a, an element of, you know, entering God's rest on a daily basis. And then also has the idea of, again, the promised land is would be their inheritance. And their inheritance is ruling with Christ. Um, and that was their birthright. And again, that's why Esau is brought up. And, and, and again, he's warning him, don't be like Esau and, uh, you know, forsake your birthright. And here's a... And so uh, that's very interesting, too. And another thing, too, is that, you know, what in Hebrews where it says... Um, you know, if we go on saying willfully, well, again, I've studied this very carefully and, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that's a direct parallel to numbers 1530, where it says, but if any person does anything, uh, presumptuously, and if you look at that Hebrew there, it's actually with a high hand and what, with, well, what a high hand means, if you look at that, that phrase high hand in the Bible, it's always meaning you're swearing. Like a Abraham swore to Melchizedek with a high hand and it's basically saying, I'm, uh, it's raising your hand like as as in in, in invoking an, and in uh, invoking an authority, you know, it, and the context will just tell you what authority you're invoking. Um, 
and again, Abraham was invoking the authority of God. I, hey, I'm not going to take any of the plunder from uh, the battles that I was just in. Uh, you know, he, he swore to God, essentially, on God's authority. I will not do that so that you can't say that, uh, you know, God didn't, uh, wasn't favoring me. Uh, and so, anyways, he says, uh, but the person who does anything, this is number 1530, but a person who does anything uh, presumptuously, whether he's a na native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord or blasphemes. And that's exactly what the Hebrews were, were, were uh, in danger of. If they went back and cr crucified the Son of God and trampled the Son of God underfoot, they would bring, be, be, be re bringing reproach on the Lord. And it says, and he shall be put to death, cut off from his people. If you look at that word cut off, he actually says cut off twice. Like cut off, cut off. It means like he's totally cut off. Uh, and it, why is he cut off? Because he has despised the word of the Lord. He has broken his commandment. And that word for commandment there is basically his law. He forsook, he complete, he, he's going to be completely cut off because not only did he violate, you know, a, a, just a statute of the law, he actually raised his hand against the law and saying, I, I reject this law, I reject the Lord, I reject his authority. That was the sin of a high hand in the Old Testament. And that's exactly what was, these Hebrews were being in danger of if they went back to the, uh, that they went back to the law because they would be, Basically, setting your high hand, high hand, you know, uh, not um, not holding fast to their confession, and so they would be setting their uh, their hand defiantly, saying, "No, I I reject this grace. I reject what Christ did, and I'm going back to the law." And um, that's why he warns them sternly that if you do that, you know, you can you can expect judgment. And here's a here's a, a very uh, clear parallel as well, um, where it says consuming fire. It says. That's a direct, again, I believe it's a direct, and it, it lines up exactly what I said. And I, it'd take me much more to fully convince, I think, anyone and unpack this fully, but I'm just giving you a little bit of tidbit here and there. Um, but here's, this is, uh, again, I think this is pretty profound. If this is a, where he says, therefore, in Hebrews uh, 12, 28, he says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, again, un unbelievers not receiving a kingdom, uh, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And then, so that's Hebrews, but here's a direct parallel in Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 24. It says, this is again Moses saying to the Israelites, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of your Lord, which is what, exactly what uh, the author of Hebrews is warning these Hebrews about. They were going to forget the covenant of grace that they're under because they've become dull of hearing and uh, become sluggish and uh, they were being tempted to go back to the law. So again, it says in Deuteronomy 4, 23-24, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of your God which he made with you and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For, your, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire a jealous God. So his jealousy is a consuming fire. If you go back to the law, God, or any other God, <laughs> you know, God is jealous. But he's not jealous of people that are not his people. He's jealous of people who are his people, who have a relationship with him, who are under grace. And if they were to forsake that and go back to the law, uh, you're going to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, and it says it's a fearful thing. And um, again, we fall in, into the into the, the hands of the living God, and that, again, that's not a threat of hell. It is you're going to fall into His hand of, chast, of chastisement. And uh, there's a verse uh, I think it, it's in Proverbs that says um, I can't remember the exact. I wish I had it offhand, but it says um, uh, a righteous man may fall, but if he fall, he will not utterly fall because the Lord God himself upholds him so we could fall in our walk with god in our you know we could go fall into apostasy god forbid and that's why we need to be on guard against it for not only ourselves uh or the but for others and again i, I see again so many parallels irrefutable to me parallels between in second peter and hebrews about it's an, an exact application of the parable of the sower where um, again, the first only the first soil was unsafe because they never believed. But the other soils, uh, they, if they're not nurtured uh, with God's word, and that's what he even says in Hebrews, 
that the, when the rain comes down, which is again a picture of the rain of God, uh, the the picture of God's word, which waters the believer, waters the seed in the believer. Um, you know, if if it if it uh, if it produces a crop, it's blessed. But if it produces thorns and thistles, again, an allusion to the law. That's a cur allusion of the law, which is a curse. Uh, that its ground will is is uh, will, will be burned up near near to being cursed. Does it? It has not. That doesn't mean you're going to hell. It just means if you go back to these, uh, I believe personally, if you go back to the law here, uh, I think it has AD 70 in view. Uh, and if you go back, you're going to get caught up in that judgment, not intended for you, but you're going to be caught up in that wrath that God is about to uh, unleash on the on that uh, perverse and wicked generation that rejected Christ. You're going to get caught up in that. Um, that's what I personally believe. Um, but again, the consuming fire here, I believe, is it's in relation to his jealousy. He's jealous for his people, and I'm glad he is. I'm glad that God's jealous for me. He's, he, you think you're zealous for God? He's more zealous for you. Um, so I could go on about more, more, more about that. I want to do a video on, on this sometime to unpack all this. Uh, but uh, that's be my initial take about him being a consuming fire. Okay, thank you. Um, well. Oh, the question is, if there is now no condemnation for those in Christ, which is the truth, why does Hebrews 12, 29 remind us that God is a consuming fire? So the questioner is trying to uh, get us to address that uh, it seems to be a contradiction. Uh, oh, is that saying that believers who are not condemned have to be reminded that God's a consuming fire kind of as a threat that, hey, you might end up being consumed and going to hell. Well, it's impossible for it that to be the intended meaning. Why is it impossible? Because the, the everything that uh, in Hebrews leading up to that uh, contradicts it, disagrees with that. That's the whole point of the book to tell us that uh, we don't have to uh, have any worries. We have this guarantee of eternal life uh, through faith in that Christ's work on the cross was sufficient. And so, uh, in fact, it would be a contradiction. I, I believe uh, Paul wrote uh, Hebrews. Um, of course, uh, that's a kind of a, there's there's really no consensus on that. I think a lot of people I know believe Paul wrote, wrote Hebrews, but uh, it's certainly not settled. A lot of people disagree. Uh, I think the Hebrews was written kind of as a uh, sequel to Galatians by Paul, because in, in Galatians, Paul is saying, look, there's false teachers coming in and they're spoiling the work I've done. Or we, or I taught you about grace and no works for salvation. And, and then they, you come in, you're believing teachers to come in and tell you, no, it's false gospel from Paul that you need to uh, also uh, get circumcised keep the Sabbath, follow the laws of Moses. And, and so Paul saying no, those that's false teachers. Well, the only thing that's not mentioned in, um, in Galatians that we see in Hebrews is one additional thing that they're saying is required. You still got to uh, have temple worship and you got to have animal sacrifices. So now Paul is saying not only uh, is uh, circumcision and these things not part of salvation, but especially, you better not impose uh, animal sacrifices on the church either. Uh, because, see, in the beginning, uh, all the believers were, were Jews. And uh, in the beginning, they, they thought that uh, Jesus came only for the Jewish people. And what you do is you, you continue practicing Judaism, including animal sacrifices, everything in Judaism. Uh, and now you believe, in addition to practicing Judaism, you believe that the Savior came. Jesus is the one that was promised. Uh, but uh, so they thought you, you had to practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. And so Paul has to straighten this out, saying, no, not only is, is uh, this uh, Christ not only for Israel and the Jews, he's for the whole world, but don't tell uh Gentiles, they have to convert to Judaism and believe in Jesus. And if you are a Jew and practice in Judaism, you must not have faith in Judaism and Jesus. You've got to believe entirely in Jesus, not 
Jesus plus religion. So that's that's how I see that that uh, Galatians and Hebrews are, are kind of like a, a two part message. Um, the first chapter of Hebrews is the most important and best part of the whole Bible. If you want to learn who Jesus is, read the first chapter of Hebrews. But the rest of it really is about this issue that uh, there are people who uh, are telling their family, hey, you're not, you believe in Jesus now, but don't forget, you got to still come to the temple and do the, do the animal sacrifices. And there was a lot of pressure on them, uh, peer pressure, family members telling other people, friends telling other people, hey, don't stop coming to the temple. That's, that's what Paul is saying. And he's saying that he's antinomian, acting like you don't have to follow the laws of Moses anymore. So that's the controversy, and that's what's being addressed in the book of Hebrews. So how could you think that if that's the message that Paul is preaching in Hebrews and Galatians and everywhere else, and that's the message of the, the Bible as a whole, that at now at this point, finally, it's it's saying that, well, you're believers, but uh, hey, I got don't forget about that consuming fire if you uh, do something wrong. No, it, the consuming fire is there to say, if you're someone who has not understood this gospel and thinks you got to practice Judaism and believe in Jesus, then you don't understand the gospel. So remember, for those people, God is a consuming fire. Uh, it, it, it's not a threat against the ones who understand the gospel. If you understand the gospel, you know that consuming fire is not a threat against us. All right. Uh, all right, uh, Renee or Ben, would you like to say any more? Yeah, I just wanted to say your point. Um, some evidence of that, that there wasn't clarity besides the book of Acts, and we see in the transition, the confusion, is it mentions some of the Pharisees did believe, but they denied believing in Jesus for fear of being kicked out of the temple. So there were some that were still dealing with the second temple system, Levitical temple system that did believe in Jesus. So this letter would have been very necessary.